In this special edition of O'Reilly Radar, we're taking a look at three of our top interviews from the 2012 Strata Conference in California. Up first is Hadoop creator Doug Cutting, who looks at the similarities between Linux and the big data world. I wanted to ask you, you gave an interesting keynote this morning, and in it uh, you said something that I quoted because it was interesting, but I wanted to unpack it a little bit. All right. You said, uh, what do you mean by Hadoop being the kernel of a distributed operating system in a big data ecosystem? Alrighty. Um, so a kernel in the sense of an operating system kernel, mm -hmm. um, uh, where the kernel um, is the, the, the central part of the operating system that uh, allocates resources um, amongst various users um, and makes sure that it doesn't overcommit the resources um, uh, and usually provides for storage um, and the basic uh, um, I.O. operations. Um, and these are basically the facilities that Hadoop is now providing. Um, and the other part that's good about this metaphor is that it, it is a central component that doesn't exist on its own. It isn't used on its own. Uh, so if you're familiar with Linux, um, uh, there is this uh, open source project, the Linux kernel that Linus Torvalds runs, um, and it's pretty useless on its own. Um, uh, anybody who uses Linux has a windowing system, uh, has you know various application layers um, on top of that that aren't, properly speaking, part of the Linux kernel. Uh, they're all separate projects, so they're assembled into a distribution by you know, Red Hat or Ubuntu or Android. Uh, various people build um, systems on top of this uh, that all share this common kernel of an operating system. And we're seeing the same thing in the big data world. Uh, we've got Hadoop, which has um, uh, HDFS, the, the file system for storage, for persistent storage. Um, uh, you've got MapReduce, which is the execution layer. Um, and then there's uh, authentication and authorization services and all the resource management for memory and processors on, on these machines and the network as well. Um, and, uh, and how to allocates all these. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we have um, these various tools that people actually use. Um, so there's um, Pig and Hive, which are languages where you can write queries um, to search your data. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, uh, Uzi, which will uh, control workflows, which series of, of tasks um, over your data. Mm -hmm. um, there's HBase um, for it, which is an online key value store, which uh, keeps its data in HDFS uh, running in this world. Um, uh, there's Scoop for importing, uh, so importing data um, uh, back and forth between relational databases and Hadoop. Um, uh, what else can I think of? Um, Flume for um, uh, bringing streaming data in from web servers. So anyway, it's a whole suite of projects around this, and it's, and it's growing, and they're all interoperating. Um, and the thing that they have in common is this kernel that they all build on top of and share. And that gives them the, the foundation um, uh, that, that, in some sense, lets them, them all exist. All right, that, that cut through it very nicely right. for me. So thank you. I, I think there are uh, probably lots of other people out there who wanted that kind of explanation of what's happening and, and trying to understand how these pieces fit together. And uh, it, it seems pretty clear that Hadoop has become a foundational piece in that context. Yes. And, and if you talk about a kernel with an operating system, that really is a good metaphor. Yeah. And as with Linux, you know, people talk about Hadoop and they mean more than the, the Hadoop project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they mean the whole ecosystem. Just like with, when people say Linux, they don't just mean the kernel, they mean the whole ecosystem that goes with it. So this is actually a, a good lead into the next question then. Uh, and, and we could use Hadoop as a, maybe as a, a, a umbrella term. Um, if you're an organization that's considering adopting Hadoop, um, what are the key lessons learned from where uh, other people's experiences have gone wrong? Um, that's a, it's a tough question. Um, so I, I'm going to probe you a little bit on, on what you mean by that. Where people have failed when they tried to use Hadoop or where they, where they failed with other technologies? Uh, where they failed trying to use Hadoop specifically. Um, uh, you know, I, I think some people um, are, get frustrated because it's a young technology um, and uh, the tools they expect to be there um, aren't there um, and uh, that, that they expect in a lot of enterprise software um, and working on is um, providing a lot of integration to existing tools. So rather than replacing um, uh, the existing uh, suite of tools in, that, are, that are used in data centers, uh, augment them. Uh, so you can, you can pour data into how to run the analyses there that are appropriate and then, and then pull things out and do visualizations and so on. Um, uh, so I think people's expectations um, uh, can be a little off. Uh, oftentimes people will have problems that really don't um, require that much data. They don't require, you know, Hadoop's like a, a, a freight train for data. Um, and if you don't have that much data, it's kind of silly to use a freight train. 
okay? yeah. and, and it's wasteful. And so um, people see it, they need to realize what is it good for and what is it not good for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not out and out replacing all these existing technologies. Mostly it's enabling people to tackle problems that they couldn't tackle before. So it sounds like the, the pain point, if there is one, is understanding what the tool is really for and, and what down the road in implementation, not so much with the technology itself. Is that? Yeah, I think that's fair. I, think, I mean, I think it's an education issue. It's a, it's a new technology. Um, uh, most professionals have, are accustomed to the tools they know, um, and learning new tools takes some time um, and getting up to speed and what, what they're capable of, what, what they're appropriate, you know, what the appropriate uses are for them. Uh, and, and so we're, we're seeing that growing. I mean, events like this. Uh, if people are learning, learning what, what, what it's good for and what it's not. So, uh, last question. Um, mm -hmm. You've been, uh, I think, part of Cloudera for a while now, right? Yep. Uh, a couple yeah, of two years. Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, th this is, here we are in 2012, uh, quite a bit has changed in this space very quickly. Um, what's the most important thing you've learned about big data over the course of your career in this particular context? Um, so, I mean, certainly in the course of my involvement with, with the Hadoop technology, um, I've learned just how generally applicable it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I got started in this because I was interested in web search, and that's how uh, you know, Google developed a lot of this uh, mm -hmm. because of that, and, and Yahoo as well got involved in this. Um, and then I think we, we all learned uh, that there's a, a whole suite of problems uh, which are amenable to the same class of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that's been, that's been really um, a surprise, but a pleasant one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we're seeing you know, events here where um, uh, people from all kinds of industries are finding that this, you know, it's useful. You know, uh, medicine, uh, petrochemicals, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we heard a great talk, I think, yeah. on uh, guns, oil, and crime yep. this morning. That was, so. that was Mike, yeah. Yeah, that, that also from Cloudera. Yeah. So uh, yeah. interesting to see the different applications, uh, and thank you for joining us today. You're uh, very welcome. In our next interview, Max Gadney from After the Flood looks at the benefits of video data graphics. What is a video data graphic? And what can it do that a traditional infographic or visualization can't? So we've seen a few of these things emerge recently. The, the context has been set by the rise of on-demand video, by the rise of broadband, and there's new formats have kind of come along, things like the conference videos online or the sort of um, how-to videos that kind of make up experts or you know, kind of home enthusiasts create mm -hmm. online. So there is precedent for these short-form videos away from the structure of TV, network, half-hour, one-hour slots that kind of are kind of short and informative. And the video data graphic um, uses as its main materials for storytelling, not necessarily talent, um, celebrity talent, or um, or kind of um, fantasy, but actual kind of real. It's based in real data. It's based in real stuff. It tries to enliven subjects that are um, typically kind of um, have a lot of data about them. Now, does video increase development on an exponential scale? Is it infinitely harder than a static graphic, or can you take some of those lessons from the static side and apply them? So, yeah. It, well, video, will, video does a few things. Um, it holds attention very well. Um, in order to hold attention, it needs a story behind it. And I think there's a lot of discussion around in the sort of data circles from how you tell the story about stuff. I think lots of, the, lots of data um, sort of books, talks, things you hear are all about the finding the analysis, finding you know, facts and everything like that. I think people kind of conflate that with finding a story necessarily. You, know, you can find a fact by an X and a Y coordinate, you know, it's not necessarily a story, I think. So the key skill then um, comes in as finding the story in that data, where you might want to choose to use analytics or data scientists, but ultimately at some point there needs to be a team assembled, and that's where it becomes, I'd say, more tricky than doing a traditional print graphic, or just a, an interactive which is kind of known now, you know. It's inter interesting, the New York Times has moved, not necessarily away from, but one of the most rewarding things they've done recently was a, um, a video graphic of the um, hit of the baseball um, pitcher Rivera um, and how he just how he practices yeah. his art um, now I think about two years ago that would have probably been a kind of like rather large interesting you know interactive done by newyorktimes.com where you'd probably be able to kind of go through all his stuff and okay quite interesting but it's the language of analytics the language of complicated sort of discovery is not necessarily for a mass audience hmm. so my particular work I do and I think I personally think more work that should happen in the analytics world is how you communicate to this mass audience Ultimately, CEOs, um, people who don't really have time to get involved with those complexities of how data is typically told to people. And that's where the need for storytelling comes in. Hmm. So then I think that the, you then have the need for um, a team to do this, um, in the same way you have teamwork in certainly the interactive sphere. Um, so the team to do this is 
generally an executive producer, um, kind of design director, that's a role I tend to fulfill. Um, you then have a, a script writer, um, a animator, design, animator slash designer. It's not just an animator who gives life, it's, an, it's a designer who gives, helps give meaning also. That's sure. very important. Um, because lots of animation you'll see in short film festivals or Sundance or somewhere like that. It's quite cool, but it's basically a bunch of dancing, you know, it's a bunch of dancing angle poise lamps, you know, which is <laughs> it's quite good at the beginnings of technology, yeah, but actually yeah. when you're going to do something meaningful with it, um, you, need, you, need, you need people who can give not just form and function, but kind of help to give meaning. Mm -hmm. And you also need a sound designer. But the heart of that is the, is the person, the executive producer, kind of pulling it together, you know, and... That's what, and once you've found your story, your concept, the executive producer is the person then making sure everyone sticks to that. Like a coach on a team, like a coach on a baseball team, shouts from the si sidelines about what to, keep, what to keep, stick at. And so it is harder. It, um, generally, you know, three, they say that, you know, it's a week's animation for every minute of, um, every minute of footage yeah. that you want. I mean, you know, it depends. I think you see a lot of them online now, which are obviously cheaper. They're do done in flash. And they're okay. You know, I mean, none of this is bad work. But, you know, is it all it can be? And I don't sure. think it all is, because I don't think they're all using, um, taking advantage of the strength of video medium, which is ultimately about depth and a quality and engagement, which is a little more expensive. But then these things, if they live online, like I think you've seen, you know, we've seen a few successful ones over the past few years, when they live online, they get a lot of traction, yeah. a lot of engagement. You can open conferences with them, CEOs love them. They're interesting things. They work inside business and, out and outside the business as media, too. So that's, that's a key point, I think. So there's a significant gravitational pull for these things when they're done correctly. If they're done well, yeah. And they can also, if they, if they seize on a, one of the social qualities they can seize on to help spread them around is that sense of currency. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the many things make a video sociable, including, you know, being stupid or facile or sort of naked people or something like sure. that. But the, um, you can also, though, if something is current, that makes it kind of, Makes it, and there's, a, there's a good one done recently about the credit crisis. You know that, that came out just at the right time. It obviously took some, had some work in it, um, but it was um, very much at the right time. So the work we did, you know, when we try and do them, we try and either internally we peg it to large annual initiatives, you know, like press releases or something companies have to do, or work we've done recently with the BBC. We timed this video about astronomy to come out with um, a, a large program, stargazing. They had the sort of mm -hmm. seasonal program they had on because anything, any anything, any wins that can kind of below those sales of publicity is good. Right. You know. So, last question for you. Do you feel that visualizations are evolving from just representations of data to full-fledged interfaces, ways to access a, a, a deeper experience? Yes. Um, yes, I do, totally. Um, the video work is interesting because that's often just the thing by itself, maybe existing to publicize a single idea and, and get a lot of traction with that. Um, the other sort of work I'm doing is not just the single visualization, you know, the single PDF or the single... Um, piece of software panel, a single sort of view on data. It's very much, it's as much about, you know, you need to be able to discover something within a piece of software interface um, as much as you do probably publish it. So we're doing kind of a bit of work in around um, sports statistics. So, you know, can fans or journalists using those sports statistics actually pub take that data and publish it elsewhere, obviously in their social networks or in their, their journalists in the rest of their editorial platforms and stuff like that. So the, it's all about context, I think. And it's not just the visualization by itself is interesting, but it's just... It's just a part of the design, like figuring out typography in an editorial website 10 years mm -hmm. ago. You know, it's, it's part of your overall purpose to communicate, and it will need the rest of user experience as a discipline around it, I think. Right. Interesting. So, yeah. well, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate yeah, it. Great. Thanks for having us. In our final interview from Strata 2012, Kaggle's Jeremy Howard looks at the difference between big data and analytics. What's the difference between big data and analytics? Well, I feel big data is really a description of an engineering problem. It's not a description of uh, something that necessarily generates value. When, when people try and define big data, they normally define it as something like working with more data than fits into memory on a regular computer, you know, something where you have to scale across multiple machines or CPUs. These are engineering challenges, and they're engineering challenges we've had as long as I've been involved in data and analytics over the last 20 years. Analytics, on the other hand, is a description of a way of generating value from data. It could be a small amount of data, it could be a medium amount of data. Um, but what it is, it's talking about how do we take this data and generate insight from it using some kind of uh, algorithm or some kind of process which is more than just aggregating it into a table or drawing it on a graph. It includes things like predictive modeling, for example, which is one of the most important uses of uh, analytics today. So when you're starting with a new predictive modeling problem, how do you choose an algorithm? I mean, what, can you walk me through that process? Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely. But, I mean, maybe to start, I'd say choosing the algorithm is probably the least important question. So that, that was a great to, question. Then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it leads us in exactly the right direction, sure. which is uh, uh, to talk about what kind of choices do you have to make when you're looking at predictive modeling. Mm -hmm. The th most important thing when you're looking at predictive modeling is to look at the question you're trying to answer. And I split that into two parts. The first is the objective that you're trying to drive. So, for example, I used to run an analytics company in insurance, which was focused around the objective of maximizing the profit of each individual customer. Mm. The second thing we look at is what I call the levers. What are the things that I can actually change that's going to impact the objective? And insurance, the most important one by far, is the price that you set. So with this in mind, the understanding that I'm trying to maximize profit by changing price, I can now go away and say, what kind of model do I need to build which would hook up those two pieces? So I then know, as I change price in this way, profit will be impacted in that way. And I can look for a predictive modeling or other type of mm. modeling algorithm that hooks them up together. So there's a considerable amount of thought that goes in advance there, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and in fact, in that case, there would be a good five or six predictive models underneath that get joined up I together. See. So for example, there needs to be a traditional actuarial risk model, which is what's the chance that Mac's going to crash his car over the next year and how much is that going to cost us? Mm -hmm. The kinds of things I would think about in designing that model would be how can I implement that? Uh, what are the regulatory issues around what I'm actually allowed to do and so forth? So people normally use fairly simple, readily describable models like logistic regression for that piece. There's a piece which will be about elasticity, which will be like, okay, if I offer Mac uh, this policy for $500, how likely is he to actually accept that? And this is now trying to model the reaction of a human brain, which is quite complex. And in this piece, I'd probably use a quite a sophisticated uh, kind of black box model like a random forest uh, or a support vector machine that really mm -hmm. can, can harness all of those deep interactions that goes into people's decision-making process. So in the end, the choice of, of a predictive modeling algorithm to me is all about what you're trying to achieve and what the constraints are. So last question for you. Do you feel that data science is defined by its tool set or is it defined more by the the creativity and the mindset of the people who are approaching these problems. It is totally about the people. Um, data science um, is actually a, a wonderful concept that has allowed a group of diverse people to come together under one umbrella and understand that they share uh, a set of tools, a way of working, um, a certain culture indeed. Um, the kinds of data scientists that work on Kaggle come from fields like myself. I'm from a philosophy background, mm -hmm. from glaciology backgrounds, physics, engineering, computer science. But what we all have, in some ways maybe there is a tools piece here. We all understand machine learning. We all understand mm. how to get a computer to answer a question for us by giving it the data rather than giving it the domain knowledge and telling it how to solve the problem. We let the machine do it for us. So this underlying theme of machine learning as a tool is something that really ties us all together. And it means that we can, as a group of people, data scientists can solve problems in domains we've never looked at before. And it, all it requires is uh, creativity, open-mindedness, tenacity, and a good skill set to do so. To me, those are the four pieces which make a good data scientist. Great. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking Thanks the very much, Mick. The Strata Conference is coming back to New York October 23rd to 25th. The call for proposals is now open. Submit yours at strataconf.com. Just a reminder, you can always find episodes of O'Reilly Radar at youtube.com slash O'Reilly Medium and subscribe to episodes through iTunes. That's all we have for now. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon.